Hello, BISC 132. This is the beginning of recorded lecture one for uh, getting more into chapter 23 protists, but but not actually getting into protists yet. Last time we uh, briefly you know started talking about eukaryotes because protists are the first eukaryotes we've come across, and uh, we've got more to say about eukaryotes before we actually get into protists. So uh, we defined you know, some of the features that uh, eukaryotic cells have last time. And a nucleus, mitochondria being a couple of those. And if we go back to this once again, uh, eukaryotes uh, evolved from prokaryotic cells. So uh, the, the most ancient, uh, evolutionarily, the most ancient type of cell uh, is a prokaryotic cell. So eukaryotes, you know, came off later, you know, split apart from archaea at a certain point. So the question is, how do we go how do we go from a simple prokaryotic cell without things like a nucleus or a chloroplast or mitochondria to a eukaryotic cell that does have these things? So there are a couple of different answers to this question. So uh, let's start with the nucleus. Uh, it is thought that the origin of the nucleus was simply, infolding of the plasma membrane. So here's what you could call a proto-eukaryotic cell uh, and you know the nuclear the nuclear envelope, the nuclear membrane really is just a, a lipid bilayer. It's thought that you know infolding of this membrane uh, and then sort of pinching off could have created a membrane system that's that's internal. And then of course all the you know genetic programming to, to maintain this to, from cell division to cell division, but that's a simple explanation for how you could have this kind of membrane bound organelle. So origin of nucleus, infolding of cell membrane. The mitochondria and the chloroplasts are a more complicated story. So it is thought uh, that the origin of mitochondria uh, is through something called endosymbiosis or endosymbiotic theory. Uh, this is essentially an extreme type of symbiotic relationship. So it, again, it is thought here's the um, you know uh, primal eukaryotic cell uh, that this engulfed a free living bacterium that was you know really good at breaking down sugars and at first that's just you know two separate living things it, what we would call a symbiotic relationship the eukaryotic cell provides you know protection and support and, and this bacterial cell uh, you know gets sugars given to it and cranks out ATP in exchange but it's thought that over time uh, this relationship got uh, more and more codependent uh, to the point where these mitochondria now have lost uh, all of the genes that they would need to be able to live on their own and are completely dependent on this eukaryotic cell. So we can't consider this really a symbiotic relationship anymore because it's not a relationship between two living things. This uh, once independent living thing is now a, a wholly dependent organelle within this modern eukaryotic cell. So uh, endosymbiosis, to read from the key terms, is the engulfment of one cell within another such that the engulfed cell survives and both cells benefit. Uh, and endosymbiotic theory is just a theory that states that this is where that organelle came from. Um, there's a lot of evidence for this, for the mitochondria um, arising in this way. Uh, one of these is that mitochondria physically resemble a type of bacteria called alpha proteobacteria. Just they're, if you remember the scale of things with bacteria, mitochondria, they're, they're about the same size, they're about the same shape. There's a physical resemblance there. That in and of itself wouldn't be enough. Uh, the biggest piece of evidence, in, in my opinion, is that these organelles have their own DNA. And if you sequence that DNA, and, and you can do that, it doesn't look like, because an alternative theory, uh, an alternative hypothesis might be that, you know, this organelle sort of pinched off from the nucleus, and that's how it has its own DNA. Uh, if, if that were the case, the DNA in a mitochondrion uh, would be very similar to eukaryotic DNA. But 
It's not. If you sequence mitochondrial DNA, you do, do the sequence alignment, it's very simple, uh, similar to that of these alpha proteobacteria, which strongly supports this endosymbiosis. And uh, finally, they reproduce somewhat independently of the cell, and the way that they reproduce is very similar to that of bacteria. Okay, so that's mitochondria. What about chloroplasts? Well, I'm going to use a term called plastids. This is just a, a bit more uh, broad. Uh, a chloroplast is a type of plastid, uh, and so you know this explanation is going to be true for chloroplasts, but it's going to be true for some of these other organelles that are very similar. So that's why I'm saying plastids. And the story here is exactly the same as it was for mitochondria, that a uh, eukaryotic cell engulfed a photosynthetic free-living bacterium. They lived together for so long that they became, you know, completely uh, dependent on one another and to the point where the chloroplast, you know, has its own DNA but can no longer live independently and this eukaryote can no longer do photosynthesis uh, without the chloroplast. So, origin of plastids, which includes the photosynthetic chloroplasts, same as mitochondria. Uh, I'm not gonna you know, write all this again, but everything I said here physically resemble bacteria, they have their own DNA, they reproduce independently, you know, all, all of that stuff is, is true for the origin of plastids as well. Uh, it is important to note the order of these events. So uh, all photosynthetic eukaryotes, plants for example, uh, have mitochondria. And a lot of people think, and I tried to dispel this thought in BISC 130 at least, that you know, photosynthetic organisms have chloroplasts. They don't need to break down sugars in a mitochondria because they are making sugars in a chloroplast, but, but that's not true. Photosynthetic eukaryotes, like plants, have both of these organelles. So the, the order of events here is the endosymbiosis of the mitochondrion, uh, mitochondria, and then in some groups, uh, endosymbiosis of um, the chloroplast. So the, the order of events here, such that all these groups uh, end up having mitochondria. So this endosymbiosis of plastids came after the mitochondria endosymbiosis. All cells with plastids also have mitochondria. Okay, so now with, with that background, now we know what a, what a eukaryotic cell is and you know how it arose. Let's talk about protists as far as, you know, what, what does it mean to be a protist? Well, the messiest thing uh, about protists uh, has to do with its phylogenetic tree. So here is a phylogenetic tree that I, I built myself. It does not include every group we're going to talk about, but it includes most of them. Uh, it, it, you know, this includes plants, this includes fungi, this includes animals. So you might be wondering, where, where's the protist? Like, which one is protist? When you, you know what a plant and a fungus and an animal is, where's the protist? The protist is literally everything else. So this is an example of an incredibly paraphyletic group. Uh, all these others, plants, fungi, animals, those are monophyletic groups. Those are clades. The, the quote-unquote kingdom protista is really just a grab bag that includes everything else. Every eukaryote that's not a plant, a fungus, or an animal, it falls under the heading of, of what we call a protist. And we're going to see when we look at these groups that, yeah, some of them are very similar to animals, and some are going to be similar to fungi, and some are going to be very similar to plants, and they're going to be all over the place. And that's because of their status as just a, a waste bin of just throw everything into this group that didn't fit anywhere else. So Kingdom Protista, quotes there, uh, is paraphyletic. It's not a clade, and obviously there ends up being incredibly diverse members. So, so what can we even say about protists? Well, there are a, a few things we can say about protists. Um, 
They're mostly unicellular. There are going to be some multicellular protists, but most of them are single-celled organisms. Uh, they can be autotrophs uh, or heterotrophs. Hey, these terms should look familiar. Here's my slide from the, from the last chapter. So they can be autotrophs or heterotrophs. Uh, or here's something new. Uh, some of them are what we call mixotrophs, uh, which is a very fun combination of these two. Yes, a mixotroph is, to read from the key terms, an organism that can obtain nutrition by autotrophic or heterotrophic means. So th these are going to be cells swimming around, eating bacteria like a heterotroph, but also doing photosynthesis. Very weird, but yeah, we see these uh, among protists. Um, we see something else new that we didn't see in bacteria. Uh, some protists, again, I have to make all these statements with things like some, uh, some uh, can engulf and take up large food particles in a process called phagocytosis. So here's a diagram of that, a large food particle uh, sort of changing the shape of the cell itself, engulfing this, bringing it in, extracting nutrients from it, uh, and then you know sending stuff out again. Um, bacterial cells could not do this because of their cell wall, uh, so that they couldn't be squishy like this and move around and be dynamic in, in this same way. So this is a new mode of uh, nutrition that we see in some protists, this phagocytosis. Um, most are motile, uh, meaning they can get around one way or another. Uh, they can do this using flagella, cilia, or something called a pseudopodia, which are temporary projections of the cell. Here's more. Uh, pseudo means false, podia. We're going to see a lot of poda uh, throughout this quarter, I can assure you of that. Poda or podia means foot. Uh, pseudopodia means false foot. Uh, and yeah, here's what pseudopodia look like. Uh, this is not a permanent extension from the cell. It's extending this extension, crawling along, and then sort of absorbing it back. It's a temporary projection. Oh, yeah, here's the cilia. We saw those in an earlier slide. Here's a flagellum. We've seen these before. These are all different mechanisms of, of protist motility. And we'll see a few examples of this. Don't worry, we will not be memorizing these, but they're always uh, fun to look at. A lot of protists end up having very complex life cycles. So... <sighs> that, that, that's all I can say about protists in general. Again, it's such a grab bag uh, tax on here uh, that it's, it's difficult to say things about them in general. So the whole rest of this chapter is going to be looking at specific groups of protists. So if you remember, with bacteria, things were too complicated to really get into all the different phyla, all the different groups of bacteria. With protists, it's still really complicated, but it's just complicated enough to be able to manage. <laughs> so um, here is going to be our um, big major slide phylogenetic tree to sort of guide us through the whole rest of this chapter. Uh, if you'll notice, so this is a rooted phylogenetic tree, but instead of you know rooted at the bottom and going up like a tree, it's rooted on the left going right, just because that's how we read from left to right for our convenience. And this is not a protist phylogenetic tree. This is all eukaryotes. So all eukaryotes, including uh, we can find fungi and animals and plants in here, all eukaryotes are, are going to be part of this. And color-coded for our convenience, we can see uh, that there are six major groups called supergroups that exist within eukarya. Uh, these are clades. Uh, so each one of these you know, color-coded things is an ancestor and all of its descendants. There are some dotted lines here because there's a little bit of uh, um, disagreement about exactly where they should fit, but but each of these are pretty solidly clades. So uh, we're not just going to talk about protists, but we're going to talk about where things like plants and fungi and animals land as we go through all of these six supergroups. So there are six supergroups in Eukarya, and all six of these are clades. And of these six eukaryotic supergroups, let's start out, we gotta start somewhere, let's, let's start out in the middle here with a group called Archaeoplastida. 
So maybe you can guess what, what's going to be part of this group. Just based on the name, it's got Plastida right there in the group name. We just talked about Plastids uh, not that long ago. And if you remember, Plastids included these photosynthetic chloroplasts. So it would be a very good inference uh, that Archaea Plastida includes photosynthetic organisms. And yes, members of this supergroup are photosynthetic. And as you can see here, this includes plants. Uh, we'll talk about chlorophytes, charophytes, and land plants when we get to our plants chapters. Uh, but you know, all, all three of these are, are the clade that we call plants. In fact, there's only one clade of uh, protists here in Archaea plastida, uh, aside from plants, uh, and that is a group called red algae. So red algae uh, gets its name from the you know, red appearance of some of its members, but again, that's only some of its members. You know, plenty of other members. The the seaweed used in uh, in nori and, and uh, sushi wraps uh, is a member of uh, red the red algae group, and it's not really red at all. So whatever. Um, and at first glance, this looks a lot like a plant, and it's closely related to plants. So a very good question is, why isn't this just a plant? <laughs> um, and these red algae are distinct from plants only if you look very closely at how they do photosynthesis. So obviously they're, they're members of this same supergroup. They have a lot of similarities, but they use different pigments and different proteins for their photosynthesis. So that's what keeps these you know, superficially plant-like things uh, in the grab bag of protists and not real plants, like all this fun stuff that we'll get into in our later chapter when we talk about plants. So, okay, that was easy. We talked about red algae and, and plants. That's one super group down. Uh, before we get to the next one, I need a, a frustrating disclaimer. <laughs> so, okay, disclaimer. The term amoeba, when we call something an amoeba, that refers to cells that are capable of creating pseudopodia, of you know crawling along in this sort of manner, uh, you know extending temporary projections, stuff like that. If a cell can do this, we call it an amoeba. Uh, the clade that I'm about to get into has amoeba right in the name. Uh, members of the following clade have this cell type, but not all amoeba type cells are within this clade. So the next clade we're going to talk about uh, is amoebazoa, but there are going to be plenty of amoeba cells that are not within this clade. I hope that makes sense. So, okay, back to this amoebazoa. So, okay, three groups to talk about within this supergroup. Uh, members of amoebazoa can have pseudopodia, do phagocytosis, they have that that amoeba lifestyle, that amoeba body body shape. So let's do two of these together, gymnamoeba and entamoebas. Um, these are naked amoebas uh, and amoebas with tests. I wish I could tell you all of these were naked and all of these had tests, but it's not true. It's the mix and match, whatever. Uh, gymna means naked, so it was thought that these were all naked, but that's not true. A anyway, <laughs> these two together uh, include some amoebas that are naked and some that have tests. So, okay, what is a test and what does it mean to be naked? Well, uh, you're a naked amoeba if you don't have a test. So, okay, what's a test? Uh, a test is a shell. So here's a, a naked amoeba, very classic looking, uh, and here's what's called a testate amoeba. So the, the shell, which is called a test, is defined in the key terms. A test is a porous shell that is built from various organic materials, that's an important note there, organic materials, and typically hardened with calcium carbonate. So this is, you know, a lot like a a shell of, of uh, other organisms, but you know, this is a single cell organism, very, very, very small shell. So uh, yeah, these two groups include some that are naked and some that have tests. Um, some are pathogenic. Uh, if you've heard of amoebic dysentery, that's um, a uh, condition that's caused by these, uh, by pathogenic uh, amoeba. And so that takes care of, uh, of two of these, the gymnamoebas and entamoebas. We got one more fun group under amoebazoa, slime molds. So 
What do we say about slime molds? Well, slime molds produce spores that resist harsh conditions. So here's an example of this. Uh, again, complicated life cycle. This is definitely not the most complicated we'll see in this chapter, but fairly complicated. And uh, yeah, it's you're fusing cells, you're making plasmodium, you're dispersing spores, and, and they can resist harsh conditions before growing up into, into more of these uh, amoeba. Um, this is very similar to the, the MO of a fungus. And so uh, these were misidentified as a fungus for quite some time. It was uh, more thorough analysis, including genetic analysis that puts them not with fungi, but in the grab bag of protista. So uh, slime molds include two basic types. Uh, plasmodial slime molds and cellular slime molds. Uh, plasmodial slime molds are a multi-nucleated mass. So that means a bunch of cells all connected together with a bunch of nuclei, which again is a lot like what fungus is going to be like. A multi-nucleated mass of cells that move along surfaces eating stuff. You, you, you got to see what this looks like because it's freaky looking. Uh, this includes the dog vomit slime mold. It, it, it doesn't move at a rate that you can see with your eyes, but there are some cool stop motion videos of this stuff crawling along that looks really neat. Uh, and here's the pretzel slime mold as well. Again, looks a lot like a fungus, uh, but again, genetically, evolutionarily, it's just converged on a similar lifestyle of living on the ground and you know eating stuff around it like a fungus would. Uh, so this is a plasmodial slime mold. Those two uh, cellular slime molds are not as big. They're single-celled, but they form aggregates to, to release those spores. So here's a, an image of sort of some slime molds forming these aggregates. A very complicated stages here. Slug, Mexican hat, I don't name these things, uh, and then eventually getting into this fruiting body, which uh, you can barely see with the naked eye, this uh, aggregate of this slime mold, again, to, to release spores to go off and, and, and live somewhere else. So this is another type of, of slime mold. Okay, so uh, there's another group down. We're moving through these fairly quickly, but we will not keep up this pace for very long, unfortunately. So uh, the next one to talk about is Opisthocanta down here. So members of Opisthocanta uh, all have a unique flagella structure. It's not very exciting to look at, but I mean, it is one of those uh, synapomorphies uh, that tie members of this group together. And if you look closely, this uh, supergroup includes animals and fungi. So, yep, Opisthocanta, animals and fungi are here. Nothing to say about them now. They will each get their own chapters in the future, but you should be familiar now that these are members of this Opisthocanta supergroup. Uh, so what are the protists in this supergroup? Well, protists in this group include uh, uh, protists called Choano or Coano, the, the H is silent, uh, Coanoflagellates. Uh, so these are colonial cells that have, you guessed it, flagella based on the uh, flagellates there in the name. Uh, coano actually means collared uh, in Latin, I believe. So these are collared flagellates. Uh, they look like exactly what you would expect them to look like. <laughs> this is a, a cell with a collar and a flagellum. So coanoflagellates, you yep pretty on the nose. Uh, and this is one of the most generic, boring looking cells that you could possibly imagine. Uh, they, you know, form these colonies. They're, they're single celled organisms, but they, they group together and form these, these aggregates, these colonies to work together. Their claim to fame, and we'll, we'll see this again uh, when we talk about animals, is these coanoflagellates are the closest living ancestors to animals. When we look at the simplest animals there are, sponges, they're going to have a lot in common with these colonial protists and long story short uh, it's thought that you know the the jump from colony to multicellular organism uh, not a big jump uh, is what led to the evolution of animals but anyway just for now know about these uh, coanoflagellates colonial cells with flagella they're closely related to animals uh, the other group within Opistocanta is a group called Nucleariids, the double I right there. Uh, 
I am not a stickler for, just side note, I am not a stickler for spelling on any of this stuff. Uh, my tests, as you know, are, are all multiple choice. I'm not going to trick you with a question where, you know, one of the options I've misspelled in very subtle, different ways. So, yeah, I, I can't you know, correctly spell half of these things myself, but yeah, anyway. Uh, nucleariids, uh, these are amoeba. So again, I told you that there would be cells with this uh, amoeba body type outside of amoeba zoa. Uh, th these nucleariids are amoeba with thin pseudopodia. And so this is a little bit different. You know, a pseudopod is a temporary projection from the cell, and we talked about it uh, previously as a way to move around, a sort of crawling moment, movement. Uh, the purpose of a thin pseudopodia like this, and we're going to see this in several other groups of pronists, is to extend out the cell membrane and then absorb nutrients or other things through all this surface area. This is a great way to sort of drink or absorb stuff from your surroundings, uh, these thin extensions uh, really up your surface area, so make it very, very good for doing that. But that's all I want you to know about nucleariids. They're in Opistocanta. They're amoeba with thin pseudopodia. All right, so uh, what do we have next? Well, next up is a supergroup called Rhizaria. So this is going to include three groups within this. Uh, I, I have nothing to say <laughs> about Rhizaria uh, as a, as a supergroup. There are no easy uh, synapomorphies or featured share features shared within all members. So just know the the next three things are under this umbrella of of Rhizaria. Uh, so one group of Rhizarians is a group of protists called Forams. <sighs> Also, amoeba with thin pseudopodia. Uh, you know, I can't make this up. Here's a, a nucleariid, which is opistocanta, and here is a foram, which is rhizaria. It's just, it's an effective body plan. It's an effective feeding strategy. You can get two groups uh, that are not closely related to one another. There are the forams here uh, and the uh, rhizaria uh, were, were elsewhere, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, nucleariids were down here, uh, distantly related, but with very similar cell bodies. That's convergent evolution for you. So sorry if it's frustrating, but it is the way it is. So forams are amoeba with thin pseudopodia. Uh, they form complex tests. So these are porous shells, if you'll remember. So they're able to extend these thin pseudopodia out through the holes in these tests. So it can protect them, but they can still do their thin pseudopodia. Um, importantly, uh, if you remember, I made a, I made a point of this, uh, that tests uh, are composed of organic compounds. That means carbon. So these, uh, these forams make these tests and they die. And these tests, you know, sink to the bottom of the ocean, and they act. At, you know, some of these are very pretty looking, uh, very small. Uh, these tests sink to the bottom of the ocean and form what's called a carbon sink, which is very important. All the carbon that's tied up in these dead foram tests uh, is carbon that's not in the atmosphere. So, uh, very important for them for them to do this. Um, Another interesting thing about forams, uh, a lot of these have symbiotic photosynthetic partners. I, I don't have a good image for this, but uh, even as a single-celled organism, you can partner up and have a symbiotic relationship. So a lot of them effectively do photosynthesis through this symbiotic relationship. Uh, so that's forams. Uh, another member of this supergroup, Rhizaria, is a group called Radiolarians. Stop me if this sounds familiar. Amoeba with thin pseudopodia is another one of these. Uh, they form complex shells from silica, which sounds familiar, but it's not. Uh, maybe the shell thing should be familiar, but silica is, is basically, it's basically glass, basically sand. Uh, that's not the same thing as a test. 
Remember, a test was calcium carbonate and, and organic compounds. A silica shell, even though it's still a shell, uh, is, is not a carbon sink, and it, it's made in, of a very different type of chemical compound. Uh, here's what one of these looks like, uh, even smaller than those tests. Uh, a, a curious thing to say about these is, if you know what you're looking for, these radiolarians have gone through different evolutionary events in the planet's history. Uh, paleontologists can look at you know, fossilized radiolarian shells and know what time period they're looking at by the, the shapes of radiolarian shells that are found in that rock. So I'm kind of a random fact, but I mean, something unique to this group uh, that radiolarians make useful indicators uh, in fossil records. So moving along, still within Rise area, our next group is a group called uh, Circozoans. Um, <laughs> diverse forms, uh, some of them have a test, some of them don't have a test, some of them have a shell, some of them don't have a shell, so <laughs> Again, evolutionary, evolution is a messy thing. I, I wish I could just like invent a group and they all have tests and invent another group and they don't, but whatever. Circozoans, some with or without test, with or without shell. Uh, and some of these are photosynthetic. So uh, here's just you know, some of these, uh, not particularly special looking, but you know, just to see some uh, circozoans. There is something interesting to point out here. This doesn't sound, you know, like a big deal. Oh, yeah, sure, some of them are photosynthetic. But if we go back to this big, you know, super group here, uh, these circozoans are photosynthetic, which means they experienced, they, they had to have uh, experienced that uh, endosymbiosis event to acquire plastids, to acquire photosynthetic chloroplasts. But look at these other photosynthetic protists, red algae, these also uh, were photosynthetic protists. They're not closely related to one another. What that means is these two groups of protists, and there are gonna be other photosynthetic protists as well, these groups of photosynthetic protists had their endosymbiosis independently of one another. This endosymbiosis event of plastids has occurred several different times within eukaryotes. So the type of chloroplasts that circozoans have, the endosymbiosis that allowed them to do photosynthesis completely independent of the endosymbiosis that allowed red algae uh, and plants even uh, to have their photosynthesis. And there are going to be other photosynthetic protists later as well. So this uh, is, is a point to, to mention that this uh, endosymbiosis has happened multiple times. So, okay, some of these circozoans are photosynthetic, and some are parasites of fungi. So this is uh, kind of an, an interesting twist on uh, this thin pseudopodia. Uh, so I, I mentioned before, these are good ways to you know, absorb nutrients from the surroundings. Uh, well, this circozoan, the Vampirella uh, laterita, lateritia, um, is actually a parasite of fungi uh, that stabs, I, I couldn't find a good image showing it doing this, but you could imagine uh, stabbing these thin pseudopodia into a fungal cell and then absorbing nutrients from its cytoplasm and earning the vampire part of its genus. But uh, so yeah, so some are parasites of fungi, they steal nutrients from the cytoplasm uh, of their host uh, using needle-like uh, thin pseudopods. Okay, so that took us to the end of Rhizaria, Radiolarians, Forams, and Circozoans. We've got a couple of big groups left, but this is typically where I run out of time uh, in lecture 1-4. Uh, so I'll cut things off here. Uh, we'll finish up this chapter in the next recorded lecture.